Hi everyone, in this video I will explain what momentum is. If you want to skip ahead to the problems, you know, you can just uh, check the timestamps below and I left each problem with the timestamp so you can just go ahead. Otherwise, I will explain what momentum is now and a little bit on isolated and non-isolated systems and how you can check which one it is because it will help you with the problem solving. What is actually momentum? Basically, momentum is just a mass in motion. The equation for momentum is just lowercase p will represent what momentum is, and that equals mass times velocity. So if you have an object going really quickly, then it will have a higher momentum than something going slower because the velocity increases. And if you also have something with really big mass, like a train on an airplane that is moving, then that will have a greater momentum than something very small, like a plastic bag. Now, you might have heard of something called isolated or non-isolated systems. What does this actually mean? For an isolated system, let's imagine there's empty space and two balls in it. So it's like the one we're measuring here. And there's nothing else in this empty space. We can consider this an isolated system. You can see that the only force applied on mass 1 is going to come from mass 2. And the only force applied to mass 2 will be from mass 1. It is an isolated system since no forces are applied from outside to this closed system. We can say that in this system momentum will be conserved. In other words, the total momentum will always be the same. It will not increase or decrease. Now, we can go back to Newton basic laws. Remember that every force, so in this case you have a force going from mass 2 to mass 1, every force will have a reaction of the same magnitude and opposite direction, that's Newton's third law. We can just move it to the other side so we can get them both positive, so you have F21 plus F12 equals to 0. So now we can go back to Newton's laws again, remember Newton's second law, which just explains that force equals mass times acceleration. You can just rewrite this and say m1 acceleration 1 plus m2 acceleration 2 equals to 0, because those are the two forces. So we're just using Newton's second law to rewrite this equation. The next thing we can do is, if we remember the definition for acceleration equals the change in velocity over the change in time, we can just rewrite that again. So we have m1 and then change in velocity over change in time for the first mass plus m2 change in velocity over the change in time again equals to zero. Let's factor out d over dt, which is the change in time because the both terms have it. And then we will get that the change in time of m1 v1 is just the momentum of the first ball because it's mass times velocity plus m2 v2, which is the momentum of the second ball, equals to zero. This means that throughout time, the total momentum will be constant. You might transfer momentum from one of the balls to the other ball. However, the total momentum or the sum of the two momentums will always be constant. And this explains conservation of momentum in a closed or isolated system. So in this case, we know the initial momentum of mass one plus the initial momentum of mass two equals the final momentum of minus 1 plus the final momentum of mass 2. So that means that the total momentum will always be constant. It will not change, it will just transfer from one mass to the other probably, but it will never change the total amount. What about a non-isolated system? We call a non-isolated system when a net force from the environment acts on the system. So here we can introduce a new vector called impulse. Impulse is equal to the change in momentum. Impulse can be considered the degree to which an external force will change the momentum in a particle through time. So we can write impulse equals to force times the change of time. We can Then we can get a new theorem called the impulse momentum theorem. This theorem tells us that the impulse equals the change in momentum. Let's imagine I have a box that is moving on its own uh, with a momentum of 5 kilograms times meters per second. If I push the box, so that's an external force, if I am pushing the box, I'm applying the fo this force into the system to make the box move faster. So then the momentum will change from 5 kilograms times meters per second to 8 kilograms times meters per second. So the impulse will be equal to the change in momentum. So the 8 kilograms times meters per, s per second minus the 5 kilograms times meter per second. So the impulse that I will measure here will be 3 kilograms times meters per second. 
going back to the impulse momentum theorem impulse equals the change in momentum then the equation for impulse which is equal to force times the change in time it's going to be equal to it's going to be equal to the change in momentum which is mass times the change in velocity so if you actually divide both sides by the change in time you will get newton's second law equation which is force equals to mass times acceleration you can do this on your own but that's basically the same thing so this whole concept is the same as newton's second law now this is actually very simple once you start solving some problems let's just, let's get to some problems right now problem number one at one instant a 15 kilogram sled is moving over a horizontal surface of snow at 3.5 meters per second after nine seconds the sled stops Use a momentum approach to find the average friction force acting on the sled while it was moving. This is a very straightforward problem. Remember that impulse equals the change in momentum. So we, if we must find the force, um, we can use the definition for impulse, which is force times the change in time, and that equals the change in momentum. We can rearrange this equation to get the force equals to the change in momentum over the change in time. So the change in momentum is just mass times velocity, which is 15 kilograms times 3.5 meters per second and the time that passed was 9 seconds as mentioned in the question so the average friction force will be 5.83 newtons problem number two in a crash test a car of mass 1200 kilograms collides with a wall the initial and final velocities are v initial equals negative 15 meters per second and the final velocity equals 3 meters per second if the collision lasts 0 0.15 seconds, find the impulse caused by the collision and the average net force exerted on the car. The car that is 1200 kilograms was driving to the left and that is why it mentioned negative 15 meters per second because it was going to the left and since the velocity is a vector, the negative only indicates going to the opposite side that we consider positive. Then the final velocity is 3 meters per second because that will be going. And since after the crash, the cars start coming back as a result of the crash, then it's going to the opposite direction. We know that impulse is the change in momentum. So we can calculate impulse by measuring first the final momentum and the initial momentum. Then um, we could get the difference of those. So the final momentum is 3 meters per second times 1200 kilograms, which is the mass. And that will be 3600 kilograms times meters per second. And the initial momentum is just negative 15 meters per second times 1200 kilograms. So the initial momentum is eight, well, negative 18,000 kilograms times meters per second. To find the impulse, we get the final momentum minus the initial. Remember the negative uh, times negative here is just positive. So we're adding the two. Impulse will equal 21,600 kilograms times meters per second. You can also write this as 2.16 times 10 to the fourth kilograms times meters per second. Now to find the force, remember our impulse equation again, where impulse equals force times change in time. Let's rearrange it to find the force. And force equals impulse over change in time or 1.44 times 10 to the 5 newtons. Now let's move on to problem number three. A sled slides along a horizontal surface on which the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.20. Its velocity at point A is 8.5 meters per second and at point B is 4.5 meters per second. Use the impulse momentum theorem to find how long the sled takes to travel from point A to point B. If we need to find the time and what we have available are velocities, I will approach this problem with the impulse momentum theorem equation because you have force times the change in time equals mass times the change in velocities. All we need to figure out now is the force since the force applied that is making the momentum change is the force of friction. Remember the coefficient of kinetic energy times the normal force equals the force of friction where the normal force is just mg or mass times gravity. But since force is a vector and the force is going opposite to the moving side, it is basically slowing down the sled. I will make this negative. So now let's plug in our values. The coefficient of kinetic energy times mass times gravity equals mass times the change in velocity, which is just fin final velocity minus initial velocity. You might have noticed that we do not have the mass in this problem, but we do not need the mass. Um, since we have mass 
on both sides of the equation so we can just get rid of it now we can rearrange otherwise the equation to find time so the time it took the sled to travel from point a to point b is 2.04 seconds i hope you enjoyed this video and the problems were helpful please let me know if you have any questions